Welcome to Uncover, the show dedicated to exploring what we need to know about God, the enemy, and ourselves to win the war for our destiny. Your host, Dr. Peggy Karlosky, psychologist, writer, and speaker, admits that there's no new truth, only that that hasn't been uncovered. And now, here's your host. Hello and welcome to Uncover. You know, I was uh, thinking recently, uh, in fact, actually tonight, I heard uh, that old song from the 70s, Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. And I heard that upbeat uh, sound and listened to some of the lyrics and I thought, well, you know, I never really paid enough attention to what the message of that song was. And I looked up some of the lyrics and I thought, isn't it funny that it says over and over and over, staying alive, but it also includes a verse that sounds pretty sad and depressing. It says, life going nowhere, somebody help me, somebody help me, life going nowhere, somebody help me, somebody help me, yeah, staying alive. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, do you ever feel like you're just kind of staying alive, that you're not really thriving in life? I think that all of us, to a certain degree, feel like that we're not fully having the fulfilled life that God wanted for us. And of course, I think that's almost the way it has to be to a certain extent because we're in a fallen world. And so we're never completely fulfilled. We're never going to have those perfect relationships We're yearning for more. And that's one of the hopes that I have is that, and I'll say that too many times in counseling to people, I'll say, you know, in heaven, things will be made right. You won't have those hurts in your body. You won't have those hurts in your relationships. You won't have those disappointments and that yearning that you have to be close to the Lord or those doubts that you struggle with, they'll be gone there. But what about while we are here on this earth? How can we have more of a life that we thrive instead of just surviving and just trying to stay alive, but to thrive in our life? Well, to really do that, I think we go to the Word, and the Word will give us the hints of how to have at least a more abundant life while we are here. We'll have the full life when we get to heaven, but we can have much more than most of us have. And I got to thinking about that, and it, I started at first thinking, well, first and foremost, we have to come to understand that God loves us and that we need a Savior. That first and foremost, when we get to the age of accountability, we need to come to understand that none of us are going to measure up to the holiness of our Creator. You know that When God created the first humans, Adam and Eve, they were made completely in his image. So they were functioning just like God wanted them to because there wasn't sin yet. But ever since sin came, things went haywire. I've used an analogy a lot of times that has been just real descriptive for me in thinking about what happened with the fall. My husband works at a company that makes valves, all kinds of valves. And he's told me how when they're coming down the line, you know, the engineer precisely made the right exact um, adjustments to the machine so that the valves would come out perfectly. And if any of those dimensions, anything gets off, just a minuscule degree, those valves start getting deformed. And then all the other valves coming down the line with those blueprints get off. And so all of them are messed up and have to be discarded. And to get it back on track, you have to have the engineer who designed it to come back and make the adjustments so that those valves can get back and be made perfectly. What an analogy to human beings. You know, our engineer, our creator, God himself, initially made humans in his image. So they were going to be loving and wise and 
creative and just function like him. But we know that things went haywire with the fall. And sin came in. It's like those valves. The adjustments got off. And all down the line, there was going to be deformities. And we'll see this sometimes in our own families. There's no family that's perfect. In fact, I was talking to a young woman recently, and I could tell she was struggling that she needed to deal with some things that had hurt her in her family. But I think she felt almost guilty trying to talk about it, even though it was confidential. She was saying, but I love my family. I love my parents. And but she wanted to just discuss and try to deal with some of the behavior in her family that affected her, that had hurt her. And I found myself just trying to reassure her, honey, all of our families have some dysfunction. Doesn't mean we don't love people to, fe- to recognize they're imperfect. We hurt each other. There's going to be those imperfections, and sometimes they're passed down through the line just like those valves. But first and foremost, to get back online, we have to have the engineer, and we have to have Christ to save us so that we accept him as Lord and Savior and repent. We get back online. But there's other keys to how to stay more online. And I think that goes back to understanding that we've got those two parts of us. Our spirit that's in God's image and that old flesh nature that came with the fall. That gets us out of line. And I think that just the other day I was reading a, 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 a really familiar verse in Hebrews. And it just jumped out at me of how important and beautiful that verse was. And it holds a real key to how to not only get in line and stay in line, but to have that life where we thrive, how to get back in line. And when we get discouraged in life, when we have depression and hurt, what's going to help us? We have to activate that part of us that's like him. Let me just read you these verses first, and then we'll kind of talk about what that means. This is Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and I'm going to read verse 23 and 24. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. I love that verse. That's just the verse 23. You know, we live in a world that so struggles to want to have hope. I meet with people every day in counseling that are yearning for hope. We all want to have hope. Listen what that verse says again. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That's our hope. But the next verse is the one that gives the clear indication how do we activate our spirit that's like God. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Then verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. As I was thinking about these verses, I thought, you know, we know that God is love. We know that we have to stir up the love that's in us. It also says to have good works. What are good works? One of the first things I think about is, Verse 25 that comes after that, talking about coming together and exhorting each other. And in my study Bible, it pointed out that exhorting right here was talking about three different parts to exhorting. It took the form of encouragement, comfort, and warning or strengthening. And I got to thinking about that and I thought, you know, even in the secular world, in secular psychology, in research and, and, and practice and trying to deal with depression, one of the things that they'll say, if you're, if you're dealing with somebody with some depression, get them to start trying to help somebody else. Get them involved in uh, volunteer work and trying to help somebody else. What they found was that it seemed to help lift them out of depression. It helped them. Ironically, I thought, That's exactly what the Word's talking about. Now, they didn't make necessarily the connection with the Spirit, but actually, they maybe stumbled upon how that this seemed to help people. 
I think it's because we're activating that part in us that's like our creator. It's like God. If we're really going to thrive and not just struggle to stay alive, but to really thrive, we've got to activate that part in us that's like God, that's like Christ. And that part not only loves, but it ministers to other people. So many times... If we're discouraged or if we're struggling, and even if we're not down deep in depression, but we're just kind of blah, and we're just not feeling a lot of enjoyment in our life, it's easy to focus inward. It's so easy to do that. It's just natural. It's the human nature. If I don't feel good, just to focus inward. In fact, different times I've had people sometimes you know, call to cancel an appointment and say, well, I just don't feel good. And see, when they didn't feel good, they just wanted to stay there and focus on their self. Many, many times I'll say, hey, that's when you need to get in here. You need to get outside of yourself. Many times I've so found so many people where I'll encourage them. Talk to somebody else. Minister to them. Help them. In fact, what it's saying in, in this passage in Hebrews, he said quite in good works with Encouraging other people, comforting other people, or warning other people. You know, sometimes we may gravitate towards one or more of those easier. Maybe we find that we're just an encourager. That comes more natural to us. In fact, I remember a gentleman I worked with years and years ago that came to see me, and he was so, so depressed when he came in. And his situation was so sad that I almost felt depressed. I thought, oh, what a sad situation he has. And yet, when I told him, you know, God didn't leave you here like that unless you still have some assignments. And I didn't know if I was going to offend him or not, but when he came back to see me again, it was just like he was beaming with, with some joy. And he said, you know what, Doc? I have some assignments. And he went on to tell me that he had realized that his gift but what he's drawn to, his gifting, was to be an encourager. You know, the Bible talks about encouragement as a gift. And he just kind of lit up as he told me about how he had a real heart for widows and widowers. And he would encourage them. He'd call them or he'd visit them. And he would just encourage them. It was a great antidepressant for him. It helped him not just struggle to survive, but to really start living. And I could see that in his face and in his eyes that he was really starting to not just stay alive, but stay alive in, in a wonderful way, in a more fulfilling way. And I thought, you know, I've seen others. In fact, there was another woman that I was seeing around the same time that had a real similar situation to his. But she mostly focused on herself. She wouldn't get out of herself. She wouldn't go to church. She wouldn't minister to other people. And see what that verse says? It says, don't forget to assemble yourselves together. Come together. So, so many times, if I was kind of feeling the blahs or feeling kind of down and out, I'd get into my appointments and start counseling other people, and I could just feel my, my just spirit start lifting. I could feel my countenance start to come up. Why? Because I was activating that part of me that's like my father, which was to minister to other people to love and to try to help somebody. And many times we do that not only through encouragement, but also trying to comfort others. Do you ever try to reach out and comfort other people? Just like the young girl who was discouraged about some way she'd been hurt in her family, but she loved them. I tried to comfort her by telling her, you know, we can love a person. It doesn't mean we're being disloyal just to admit that they've hurt us. We can comfort each other. And last but not least, we warn each other. And sometimes we may not want to do that. Now, some people are more comfortable warning others. But I know we need the Holy Spirit to help us warn in such a way that we don't just turn people off. But you know, a lot of the New Testament and a lot of the people who love the Lord involves warnings. When we love somebody, we tend to want to warn them. But I know we need the Holy Spirit to give our words, I don't know, just the power that comes from Him and the right timing. And when I think about warnings, 
I think about, I believe, there's a warning that not only encourages, there's, a, there's a, an insight that I've seen about eternity that fulfills all three of these. It's used as an encouragement, it's used as comfort, and it's used as a warning. And I want to share it with you. I want to share you, with you a passage from um, Psalms. There's a couple of passages from Psalms, and, and again, probably most of you who've heard me talk very much at all know that I tend to talk a lot about how temporary life is and about eternity. Because I do believe if we could see how short and how brief this life is and think about eternity, that provides encouragement when we're hurting. It provides great comfort because, you know, many times when I'm dealing with people who have been hurt in relationships, and I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, in heaven, we'll have perfect relationships. We'll be able to love each other without the, the hindrance of our old flesh nature. We will not have jealousy in ways that we get hurt here. And so I think about that. And then last but not least, a warning to think of eternity so it will live more wisely. And I saw this passage in Psalms, and I want to read it to you. It's Psalms 39, and I'm going to read verse um, 4 and verse 5. Yeah, just verse 4 and 5. Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am? Indeed, you have made my hands as hand breaths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best state is but a vapor. You hear what David's saying? David was asking him, Lord, help me recognize Show me, Lord, that my life is brief. Help me see that my life is is as just a vapor. Why did he want to know that? Why did he want God to help him see that? I think again, so that he would recognize eternity's coming. That's a comfort, but that don't get caught up in things in this life that are going to be wasteful. I think that's what David was saying. There's another passage in Psalms, and it's in chapter 90, 90 and verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Think about what he's saying here. That if we evaluate the use of time in the light of how brief life is, we'll do it more wisely. So again... If you think about how do we live a life where we thrive? First off, if we recognize we're never going to be completely fulfilled here. Number one, because it's not our home. Two, we're plagued with some things that came with the fall. These corruptible bodies that wear out. I can feel mine as I get older and the aches and pains and you know, I don't see as well, I don't, you know, and so many things that our bodies wear out. We know that with our flesh nature and with Satan and demonic forces here, there's a war and that people hurt each other. We don't have those perfect relationships here. We are have some ways that we struggle to connect with the Lord. Our own flesh gets in the way. So if we at least start with recognizing, we're never going to be fulfilled completely here. I think that right there even helps us to have a more fulfilling life, just to recognize that, to keep that in mind, that it's coming, the best is yet to come, and that when we get on the other side, we will be able to be fulfilled. Secondly, if we will activate and use that part of us that is like Christ, that's our spirit. And the main way we can do that, we just read in Hebrews, is to love people, to encourage them, to come together. It helps me when I'm just with other believers. And many times I'll do that in counseling. And we may be just talking about something in the Word. And maybe I'm encouraging them. And it ends up blessing me. When we reach out and minister to other people, 
It is an antidepressant that's free. No bad side effects, but it will help all of us to have a more fulfilling life. If we will take the time to minister outside of ourselves. Those of you that are listening to me, if you are struggling and maybe you have a lot of hurt in your life, maybe you feel dissatisfied in your marriage, maybe you're struggling with your job or your kids, it's hard sometimes, but if you'll make the choice, reach out and minister to somebody else. Maybe you're going to be encouraging somebody else that is struggling in their marriage. Maybe you're going to, you know, love on somebody that's having some problems with their children. Maybe you're going to just encourage somebody else that's having doubts or that's hurting or sick. What you'll be amazed at is as you're helping them, you're going to help yourself because you're strengthening your own spirit. And when we operate like that, it's kind of like those valves. We get back in line and we come out more perfected. Yes, and we know that none of us are ever going to be perfect till heaven, but we start functioning the way we're supposed to. Just like those valves functioned appropriately when they got back in line, according to the engineer's plans and dimensions. And in fact, I thought about so many of those valves, when they got off, they had to be discarded. They had imperfections. They got thrown away. Thank you, Lord, that you don't throw us away that you're so patient and you want us to get back in line and you've given us the blueprints in your words for how to do that we're just exploring some of them today and one of them being we've got to activate and operate from our spirit and that's going to always include ministering to other people especially when we're hurting that's the time when we're tempted not to do that and I encourage you step out even if it's in small ways Sometimes even we can find ourselves even just sometimes complimenting someone. You know, if you've been in a store and you say, wow, I love your haircut. Or, wow, that just really helped me when you ministered to me that time. Or whatever it is. I really believe that if you step out and try, yeah, the enemy may try to stop it. But the Lord is going to appreciate it and he's going to minister to your heart. I thank you so much for listening to me on Uncover, and I look forward to talking with you next week on Uncover. Lord, I pray right now for all of our listeners that you will encourage them, that, Lord, you will help them and me to not only love you, but to operate the way you do, Lord, that we'll minister to other people, and in doing so, Lord, we'll have a life where we thrive and not just struggle to survive. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.